A previous version of this video was demonetized by manual review, despite the fact that YouTube's advertiser-friendly guidelines specifically state Historical events are generally allowed to monetize if presented within the context of a documentary or historical debate. This video is very clearly about history and derived from a lecture I delivered in a college classroom because this is a very important subject for American history. If that doesn't fit their advertiser guidelines for educational content, then they don't know what education means. So since YouTube won't support this kind of content, please consider buying some merch or donating to my Patreon, all of which are linked in the description. Since YouTube not only doesn't support education, but is blatantly willing to violate their own advertiser-friendly guidelines. Hey, Cypher here. I've talked a lot about the Lost Cause myth on this channel, mostly to denigrate it. After all, today, those who believe in it are nothing more than conspiracy theorists, and are merely spouting it off as a form of hatred. But here's the thing. It didn't start off as a hateful ideology, and has played an integral role in US history. Just as it is important to understand the origins of the Ku Klux Klan, it is important to understand the origins of the Lost Cause myth. And the fact is, it's held a pretty legitimate space in our history for a very long time, including a number of historians propounding it, and not just Woodrow Wilson, who after all was actually one of its main proponents and we'll get to that. But I want to start this off by saying, this is an exercise in what Sun Tzu said, know thine enemy. For while we should absolutely denounce people who are spouting off this myth today, Lost Causer. We should realize the role the Lost Cause myth played in American history. So the Lost Cause of the Confederate States of America is a mythology that eulogizes the Confederacy. Since it is a mythology, it is not a clear movement. One can hold any number of tenets and be a lost causer, and not even realize it, for that's the pernicious effect of mythology. So there's some general tenets that can easily identify a lost causer. And all of these are often tinged with overt racism today, but that wasn't exactly always the case. Some of these were actually believed, and we'll see why. So the first one was that slavery was good for the slaves. You could see this part of the myth growing before the South even arose. Pro-slavery advocates in the 1850s often talked about how slavery was supposedly beneficial for those who were enslaved, that it was a teaching experience as they became more civilized, or that it was a means of fighting off socialism. And mind you, when these guys were referring to socialism, this is before even the likes of Karl Marx really started to take hold of the movement. So they're talking about like Saint Simon and those guys, the utopian socialists as they're often called. And there's a wealth of literature about these pro-slavery advocates. For instance, you had guys like James Henry Thornwell, who as one historian says, Unlike capitalism or communism, which Thornwell believed altered social norms, he avowed that slavery was part of the social fabric and therefore unalterable. He even believed that southern slaves had better lives than the British working class. And you'll find a lot of that kind of rhetoric with pro-slavery southerners in the 1850s. So of course that got incorporated into the general myth. The next part is probably the one that you'll see the most on the internet. They either downplay or deny slavery's role in the causation of the Civil War. Normally they'll cloak it with things like states' rights or southern loyalty. And in fact, they'll go out of their way to lionize southerners' loyalty. So they'll bring up tariffs and differences in general culture and economics as if all of those issues weren't underwritten by slavery. And when talking about the Civil War itself, they emphasize Northerner aggression. In fact, sometimes you'll hear them call the Civil War the War of Northern Aggression. 
You see, they portray the war as defending their homelands, who were simply trying to become their own country after the United States had somehow failed them. And then once the war was over, of course, then they have to reconstruct Reconstruction. So they portray Reconstruction as punitive, as though the Republicans were going out of their way to destroy the South and wreak havoc just to punish the South for even having attempted to secede. They'll especially deny the Civil Rights Acts and the various Reconstruction Amendments, and then portray the US military who were there to enforce the Civil Rights Acts as a form of further punishment, even though the US military was never actually a substantial presence. So those are the general tenets of the Lost Cause myth. They emphasize the good of slavery for slaves, downplay or deny slavery's role, lionize Southerners' loyalty, say the Civil War was purely Northern aggression, and portray Reconstruction as punitive by denying civil rights legislation. You can see how the whole system kind of works together, and how it's built upon racism. But as with any mythology, there is a grain of truth to the lost cause. And going point by point, when they're saying slavery was good for slaves, what they're often complaining about is how slavery is portrayed in the media, where all slave owners are portrayed as being the absolute worst they possibly could be. Many portrayals clearly violate the slave codes that were the law at the time. Even in 1852, when Harriet Beecher Stowe published Uncle Tom's Cabin, the South went into an uproar about how the novel was completely inaccurate to how slavery worked in the South. And in fact, the criticism was so strong that a year after publication, Stowe actually published a response called A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. The reaction to her novel was so strong that when she met with Abraham Lincoln in 1862, Lincoln said, So you are the little woman who wrote the book that started this great war. So it is a delicate balancing act when portraying slavery. Because obviously you don't want to go around saying that it was nice. But it's also easy to go too far in the other direction. And when they do that, they lend credence to the lost cause. A more recent example is the backlash against the 1619 Project. This is a bunch of journalists backed by the New York Times who are creating a school syllabus focused on the legacy of slavery as the sole driver of American history. Many historians have rightly denounced this obvious sensationalism, but that's just what journalists do. Understandably, such sensationalism fuels lost cause or retrenchment, since now they have proof of people using inaccuracies for political pandering. Engaging in the same sensationalism as Stowe allows lost causers to deny history, which becomes especially pronounced when they downplay or deny slavery's role in the Civil War. The grain of truth there is that the causes of the Civil War are super complicated. In fact, all wars are extremely complicated. That's why historians argue about what the causes were even to this day. But ultimately, slavery was at the root of the major causes of secession. In fact, the declarations of secession make that pretty clear, because they simply can't stop talking about how slavery is their way of life, and that it's threatened by Abraham Lincoln being elected. The Vice President of the Confederacy made it quite clear in what is called the Cornerstone Speech what role slavery took in Southern secession. He said, The Confederacy's foundations are laid. Its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. So while the causes are complicated, they almost always boil down to slavery in one way or another. In return for this obvious problem with their myth, lost causers tend to emphasize the loyalty of soldiers. You know, they say that's not why most Confederate soldiers were fighting. They fought out of loyalty to their state. 
but why a soldier fights doesn't change the casus belli. A casus belli, as in the cause of a war, is always complicated, and what the soldiers believe on the ground doesn't matter to that casus belli. Plus, you'll find that a lot of Confederate soldiers actually did believe they were fighting for slavery, and emphasized that in their journals, as in something that they were writing for themselves. So we can glean their motivations pretty well from that, and yeah, many of them actually were very much fighting for slavery. They saw that Lincoln's election might threaten that peculiar institution, as they called it, but in either case, it doesn't matter what the soldiers believe. Here's a fellow YouTuber who's actually spent a lot of time talking about this specific subject, making a bit about responding to comments, saying exactly this part of the myth. Checkmate, Lincoln Arts! This perspective is so biased! Yes, slavery was in the mix, but South really complex! And not ever Southern Reb fought for slavery. Hell, even Confederate generals were against the practice. So do a big homeworks on it. That's a lie. Most Confederate generals absolutely approved of slavery, and your average Confederate soldier knowingly fought to preserve it. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. I don't give a rat's ass about them rich Southern politicians whose aims were to preserve slavery. They should have been hanged. But the common soldier didn't give a shit about slaves or slavery. They were too poor. Yeah, here's the thing, and I know you're not going to want to hear this, but they did give a shit. Multiple books have been written about this topic. Yeah, Confederate soldiers went to war for a variety of reasons. Were they defending their homes and families from invasion? Yes. But they also believed that preserving slavery was in the Confederacy's best interest. His channel is called Atunshi Films, so be sure to go over and check out his channel. There's a whole lot of stuff like that, and it's pretty entertaining. Anyways, in terms of northern aggression, the grain of truth here is actually about perspective. So think about it this way. A rebellion is only a revolution when it's successful. We might call it the War of the Rebellion, but to a southerner at the time, they'd argue that the Confederacy was a completely sovereign entity, even though it was not recognized by the Union. And therefore, any military action, whether peaceful or not, can be interpreted as aggression. That means maintaining forts, supplying those forts, and pretty much everything that happened at Sumter, they'd argue they were defending their homeland. That maintaining it as a Union fort was an act of aggression, which is their justification for shooting first. Regardless of the fact, that wouldn't be considered a just cause, even at the time. And then there's some further parts to that in the way that the war itself was conducted. For instance, there was the Anaconda Plan, in which the U.S. blockaded itself. Now, according to international law at that point in time, and even today, a blockade can only be erected on a sovereign entity, at least if other countries are supposed to abide by that blockade. So in effect, the Anaconda Plan was a tacit admittance of Southern sovereignty. This really gets reinforced when the Union started using a total war strategy. With things like the destruction of Sherman's March, it becomes very easy to argue that the North is the aggressor. Of course, that forgets that people like the beloved Stonewall Jackson advocated total war strategy from the beginning of the war to attack the Union. He wanted to destroy his own hometown. And of course, all of this stuff about sovereignty and aggression completely misses the fact that sovereignty must be earned internationally. Anyone can claim to be a sovereign entity, but without the recognition of one's peers, that sovereignty doesn't truly exist. And the South completely failed in that regard. No major power recognized them as a sovereign entity. They certainly tried with Britain and France, but those negotiations went nowhere. So ultimately, they can argue that there was northern aggression, but the sovereignty of the Confederacy was never recognized. And finally, we get to Reconstruction. Now, they'll point out immediately that some congressmen really did want to punish the South, that they wanted to demote all southern states to being territories and make it incredibly difficult for them to be readmitted into the Union. Of course, looking at the declared motives of individuals denies the clear civil rights spirit of Reconstruction legislation. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were all Reconstruction Amendments. 
The first Civil Rights Act in American history was because of Reconstruction. The second was because of Reconstruction. The Enforcement Acts, the Military Reconstruction Acts, all were designed to promote civil rights. Now they'll point to states' rights, where this is an actual argument that Reconstruction was about states' rights, as in the right to come back into the Union and it had nothing to do with civil rights and that that was something that was being pushed by radical Republicans to cause some sort of retribution. They portray the violence of Reconstruction as retributive, and not that you've got Klansmen going around and terrorizing black people, but the other way around somehow. As in, the newly freed slaves were going to turn around and massacre white people, similarly to what happened in Haiti after their revolution. But here's the thing, no servile insurrection ever happened. So the fear of retributive violence simply is unfounded. So while there is a grain of truth, as with all myths like this, that grain of truth is a pretty small one but it only takes a pebble to create a sand dune. Now, interestingly enough, the Lost Cause didn't just coalesce in a fully-fledged ideology like it is today. As with any kind of abstraction, it has to be built over time. So right after the Civil War, many Southerners felt the need to explain why they seceded. In fact, one of these first books was called The Lost Cause in 1866 by Edward A. Pollard. Four years later, when Robert E. Lee died, one of the eulogies written for him by Jubal Early practically defined what the Lost Cause would be. But by 1870, it wasn't that strong of an ideology. It would take another few decades for the Lost Cause to be widely accepted. But it became more and more accepted as Confederates started joining each other in reunions and writing memoirs. These guys emphasized their service and patriotism and incidentally reinforced the Lost Cause as a consequence. The ex-president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, started doing speaking tours in the 1880s and completing his own history of the Confederacy. And all of this helped the Lost Cause gain notoriety. Eventually, people started making remembrances and political connections. So for instance, you had Confederate Decoration Day, the origin of our Memorial Day. Which, interestingly enough, Confederate Decoration Day actually began before Union Decoration Day. And the main idea is that everybody would go out and stick little flags and decorations on the graves of the fallen. By the way, this is not actually the Confederate flag, but a distortion of the Confederate Jack. The flag that you're used to seeing in terms of the Confederate flag was never actually the Confederate flag, so they can't even get that right. Then, towards the end of Reconstruction, you had Redeemer Democrats. Now, these guys wanted to redeem the South for white supremacy because the civil rights legislation of Reconstruction had actually allowed a great deal of freedom for ex-slaves. And of course, when coming from a group that emphasized white supremacy, they'd want to go back to that. And so Redeemer Democrats wanted to redeem the South by making it white supremacist again. But in doing so, they couldn't be as overt as they were during the Confederate days. So they had to come up with new disenfranchisement laws. You couldn't have guys riding around in masks intimidating black people from voting. Instead, you had to do it in much more subtle ways. So you had groups like the Red Shirts and the White League committing terrorism as a component of the Redeemers. In effect, the terrorists drove the black vote away while the Redeemers came up with legislation to disenfranchise that black vote. And in doing so, they could legitimize the lost cause because black people were no longer given a voice. So this New South could say all kinds of wacky stuff about slavery being good for slaves and whatnot because they had no countervailing voices to contradict them. And finally, in 1889, a group formed called the United Confederate Veterans. This was much like the Grand Army of the Republic, but for Confederate soldiers. And as those soldiers started dying off, there were offshoots like the Sons of Confederate Veterans and the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And especially the UDC played an integral role in pushing remembrance and political connections. So these groups would sponsor statues and picnics and various events, all of which pushed the Lost Cause forward. But simultaneously, when these statues and picnics started going up, so too did Jim Crow. 
for the Redeemer Democrats had finally redeemed the South by segregating it. But for the most part, this remained a Southern thing prior to the 20th century. But at the turn of the century, there was a real need to unify the nation. When the U.S. declared war on Spain in 1898, President McKinley purposely chose ex-Confederate General Joe Wheeler as head of the Cavalry Division, thereby symbolically reunifying the nation through an ex-Confederate. The Civil War had defined what the United States was as a nation, and the Lost Cause allowed historians to explain away how a nation once divided could unify again. You see, the Lost Cause was ultimately nationalized by historians. The U.S. history profession was a fairly new thing. For instance, the first history PhD in the United States was only earned in 1882. The American Historical Association was founded in 1884. And at that point in time, the history profession generally followed Leopold von Ronke's model. So they wrote histories of the nation and wrote it backwards as if that nation always existed. History was founded as a nation-building project, and of course the Lost Cause got muddled in with all of that. So you had folks like Theodore Roosevelt and Frederick Jackson Turner downplaying the role of slavery in American history. They purposefully omitted that stuff, or said it wasn't as important, as a way of defining the character of the United States. For instance, Frederick Jackson Turner said, when American history comes to be rightly viewed, it will be seen that the slavery question is an incident. In the period from the end of the first half of the present century, as in the 19th century, this was written in 1893, to the close of the Civil War, slavery rose to primary, but far from exclusive importance. You see, Turner is saying, don't look at slavery, look at the West. He begins that paragraph by saying, The legislation which most developed the powers of the national government and played the largest part in its activity was conditioned on the frontier. Now there's an argument to be had over whether or not this is true, but you can see how downplaying slavery will feed into the lost cause. Then there was the Dunning School on Reconstruction. It was named after a Columbia professor named William Archibald Dunning. And he especially wrote history that was from a Southern perspective. Being a redeemer himself, he lent legitimacy to disenfranchisement that led to Jim Crow. In fact, one could say the Dunning School was an integral part of Jim Crow. And essentially, they were the ones saying that radical Republicans were trying to shove civil rights down Southerners' throats as a means of punishment. Then finally, there was the ultimate legitimizer, Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Wilson! When Woodrow Wilson gained prominence by becoming the radical new president of Princeton, this lent a great deal of legitimacy to his historical work. After all, he was a historian. Now, I've talked quite a bit about him, so I won't go too into depth about his historical theories, but he legitimately believed that the Ku Klux Klan had saved the South from servile insurrection. He ended up becoming president in 1913, and then a friend of his named Thomas Dixon wrote a book that was adapted into a movie by D.W. Griffith called The Birth of a Nation. This too I have talked about, but it basically solidified what the Lost Cause was. And even worse, it was extraordinarily popular, and Woodrow Wilson helped that along by screening it in the White House. This is basically what you could call the first Hollywood blockbuster. And as a direct result of it, the Ku Klux Klan arose again. The second incarnation of the Klan was founded later on that year. At the same time, there was an explosion of monument building, picnics, and all that kind of stuff that the United Daughters of the Confederacy had been promoting for the better part of a decade. All of this coincided with an influx of lynching and further disenfranchisement laws. In fact, it was so terrible that one historian called it the nadir of American race relations. So the Lost Cause, by virtue of all this, became infused with American culture. The Second Clan was not purely a Southern thing. It ranged as far and as wide as California to Maine. In fact, some of its strongest membership was in Indiana, of all places. But the nationalist historians got what they want. 
there was general consensus about what the American character was, and it followed that Frederick Jackson Turner model. That's part of why the Western genre was so prominent. It was partly built on the denial of the role of slavery. Son, you're on your own. From 1915 onwards, there were a bunch of places where Confederate heroes are portrayed as morally equivalent to the Union. Saying that Stonewall Jackson was trash himself. Him and Lee and all the rest of them ribs. You too. and sometimes even greater with things like Gone with the Wind, where Reconstruction is portrayed as ravaging the South and destroying the quaint ways that used to be. Then there was Disney's Song of the South that characterized a wonderful relationship between master and slave that teaches the master's son some sort of life lesson. This cultural infusion made its way into textbooks, especially with the sponsorship of the UDC. It's only recently that Southern textbooks are starting to get rid of Lost Cause ideology, and many people in the comments might very well attest to having been taught the Lost Cause as a child. And that's how all this works. It gets legitimized by historians and then infused into the culture and spread further and further and further. For instance, probably the greatest Western of all time, the Searchers, John Wayne's character, is a Confederate veteran. Figure a man's only good for one oath at a time. I took mine to the Confederate States of America. But also what comes with cultural infusion is the watering down of the myth. This is where people start saying things like heritage, not hate. Where the Mississippi flag in 1894 started off as a clear representation of Jim Crow. But with the Dukes of Hazard, the horn is playing Dixie, and the car is called General Lee, with a Confederate flag plainly posted on the roof. But you see, that was just part of Southern identity at that point. They really did believe that it was just heritage, not hate. And that's the power of the lost cause, or any myth for that matter. It provides identity. But luckily, things started to change with the success of the civil rights movement in the mid-1960s. Participants could remember people waving Confederate flags specifically to continue Jim Crow. And so, of course, they began to fight against it. And right alongside all of this was the rise of the new left. This new left sought to continue fighting for civil rights into the latter half of the 20th century. They brought their ideology along as more and more of them became historians, who continued to revise history as the profession does. These revisionists demythologized the lost cause. By the time Eric Foner was writing his monumental book on Reconstruction, revisionism was in full swing. And those historians, like Eric Foner himself, clearly illustrated the association between lost cause mythology and racism. Of course, there was a severe conservative backlash as people started seeing the myth challenged. This backlash, by the way, is called the culture wars. One of the key sticking points for the culture wars was whether or not you wanted to push the lost cause myth. In fact, the person who gave the name to this conflict over America's very identity, whose name is Pat Buchanan, later clarified his position on what the culture wars meant by saying, Demands are heard throughout the South that replicas of the battle flag of the Confederacy be removed from state flags in public buildings. The old iron Confederate soldiers who stood for decades in the town square must be removed. After all, he fought in an ignoble cause. Slavery versus freedom, that's all it's about, they tell us. But go up to Gettysburg and park your car behind the Union Center, look across the mile-long field, and visualize 15,000 men and boys forming up at the tree line. See them walking across into the fire of cannon and gun, knowing they would never get back, never see home again. Nine of ten never even owned a slave. They were fighting for the things for which men have always fought, family, faith, friends, and country, for the ashes of their fathers and the temples of their gods. Even in 1992, and on into the present, 
you can hear lost causers like Buchanan subtly trying to dilute the truth with the lost cause. All for the sake of preserving some sort of nationalist identity. But eventually the new left won out, and a much better version of events is typically taught in school. But Southern identity is wrapped up in this myth, and it is often simply to maintain a sense of self rather than hating others. Just as American Western identity is wrapped up in the frontier myth and liking Wild West movies doesn't mean you want to scalp some engines, same with Southerners simply admiring their rebellious past, regardless of the problems with that. People can appreciate something despite its flaws. We don't need to destroy these reminders of a sordid past. Instead, let that past continually remind us that we're better now. The full version of the Lost Cause is a conspiracy theory because you've got to pretend that historians conspire to lie about history, so I won't abide by Lost Causers on this channel. But that doesn't mean that people are aware of the darker connotations when they wave a confederate flag or something along those lines. They really believe it's simply heritage, not hate. Heck, South Carolina was the first to secede, so they've kinda got some special claim to that symbol. Though I'd argue they should use either their secession flag or the Moultrie flag they used during the Revolutionary War. After all, if it's supposed to be about states' rights, why not use the flag that represents each state? In either case, there was a high-profile usage of the Lost Cause in that state that deafened any non-hateful form of the myth. For instance, there was the Charleston church shooting in 2015. It was clearly a targeted hate crime, for the church has mainly black parishioners. And of course, the shooter prominently featured himself with a photograph holding the Confederate flag. Since it was in South Carolina, and the South Carolina capital was still flying a Confederate flag, this prompted an entire debate about whether the Confederate flag was a symbol of hate and if it should be taken down, which eventually it was. And that's been the general dynamic for the last decade or so, that these Lost Cause memorials and symbols are steadily being taken down. That was what the main protest was in Charlottesville. So as you can see with all of this, the Lost Cause is a pretty ambiguous thing. It actually doesn't necessarily show a hateful disposition. The entire myth is founded in races, but it's been submerged in various ways over the years. But I don't even know if it's the most harmful American myth. The frontier myth might very well have caused a great deal more of human misery. But that's the idea with all of this. Mythology, even when it's harmful, is still an integral part of history. And outright denying these things can often end up spreading the myth just as much as fighting it. Perhaps that's not what Sun Tzu meant when he said, Know thine enemy. But in today's world of bigotry on the internet, knowing thine enemy means knowing their myths.